Good morning, LBC. So good to be with you, digging into God's Word again. This is our, our fifth, or fifteenth rather, and final sermon in the Epistle of James. Uh, next week is Palm Sunday, as Judy said, and if you can believe it, the following week is Easter, which happens so quickly. And after that, we're going to be digging into a new series in the Epistle of Galatians, and it would be really good between now and then is uh, if you... Uh, would sit down with the Galatians and read it in one sitting uh, several times, once or twice a day. I'm, I'm trying to do it a few times a day so that I can marinate in, in God's Word and, and so that I can allow God to, to speak to me between now and then also. So let's get ready for that, and we're going to dig into our last sermon in James, so let's pray before we do that. Father, thank you so much for your Word. Thank you that you still speak today and, and help us to have ears and hearts that are listening and ready to receive what you have to say. So I pray that you would uh, guide us this morning, and uh, I pray that my heart would be right with you and that I would only say what you want me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was young, I thought I was invincible. Anybody relate to that? When I think back at some of the things that, that, I, that I did when I was growing up, I, I'm surprised that I'm still alive. And my, my first memory with this delusion of my invincibility was when I was about three or four years old after I had watched an episode of Superman on TV. And I'm sure you can probably figure out where I'm going with this. And of course, you know Superman. He, he was almost invincible except for his weakness to kryptonite. And uh, I thought it would be pretty cool if, if I could fly like Superman and so I went into the bathroom and I grabbed a towel and I wrapped it around my neck and and then somehow without my my mother or my older sister seeing me I snuck out of the house and I walked down the street to to a schoolyard where they had a ball diamond and there were some bleachers and they were about 12 feet high and to me it looked like they were about 30 feet high it was huge but I I walked up climbed up to the top of the bleachers and and I thought that this cape was going to give me superpowers and I'd be able to fly. And so I dove off, and much to my chagrin, the towel did not give me superpowers. I, I fell like a sack of potatoes and I broke my arm. So that was uh, my first foray into finding out that I'm not really invincible. And I'm... A very slow learner, so I've been learning this slowly. I've broken several bones over the years from some stupid things I've done. I've broken my ankle several times, my knee once, my wrist, my, uh, several of my fingers, my, uh, some of my toes, my collarbone. I broke my nose. I got my teeth knocked out with a baseball bat. When I was in my early 20s, I was so short-sighted that I, I, you know, I didn't cross my mind that it might hurt if I dove off of a the top of a trestle bridge into a small river. Uh, actually, it did cross my mind, but there were some girls there, and there was a young filly that I was trying to impress. But I've lived much of my life in my younger days as if it didn't really matter what I did in the short term. I used to eat until I was stuffed and, and feeling sick, and I can remember my mother telling me, if you keep eating like that, you're going to look like your father. And I sort of shrugged it off, thinking that, that it's not going to affect me because, well, I, I just enjoyed eating and, and it, so far it, it, I hadn't noticed any difference in me. Ever since Ruth and I have been married, which is 34 years now, she's been, uh, she encourages me to make sure that I eat right and take care of my body because if I don't, it's going to fall apart. Now, in our earlier years, I would shrug that off as well until I got a little bit older. I thought I was invincible. I was active. I would... I'd play lots of sports. I, I went on backpacking trips and canoe trips and kept really active. And, and I thought as long as I kept doing that, then I would be okay. Well, my mother and my wife were very right. My body has started to fall apart because of neglect. Chuck Swindoll once said, after 60, it's just patch, patch, patch. And that's sort of what I've been learning in recent years. When I was younger, though, I thought naively that I could just go through life and neglect taking care of my body with, with no consequence. I think I've learned my lesson. Well, just as it's true of our 
physical selves, that's also true for our spiritual selves. If, if we try to go through our lives without taking care of our spiritual needs, we can expect that our lives are going to start breaking down. It happens slowly and then suddenly. We neglect our quiet time with God because, well, we have more important and urgent things to do, like watch Netflix or play video games. We neglect immersing ourselves in God's work because we think, well, we don't need it. We, we don't see the immediate benefit of doing that. We don't take time to pray about decisions that we make. We, we don't participate in fellowship with, with other Jesus followers. We, we, we don't watch how we use our tongues. We, we don't give sacrificially to the Lord's work because what good is it all doing anyway, especially during COVID? We, we don't see the immediate benefit. If we keep neglecting Caring for our spiritual needs, our lives will begin to fall apart. And it happens slowly and then suddenly. We eventually realize that we don't have the, the spiritual or emotional fortitude to, to stand up under all the pressure. And then perhaps what happens is we get bitter. We blame God or we blame the church or we blame another person for our lot in life and we wander off looking for other things that will satisfy because obviously our version of Christianity didn't work. Or hopefully we get a wake-up call that we need to take care of those things that we've neglected all these years and we realize that we can't go through life at warp speed and forget about taking care of our spiritual selves. That's what the book of James is all about. It's about the community of faith taking seriously its call to authentically follow Jesus. Now, one of the unfortunate things that's happened in, in churches is that pastors have become professionals. And it, it, seem, it seems to make sense, right? We take our, our, our cars to professional mechanics to get them repaired, especially these days. It used to be back in the day that if my car broke down, I could repair almost anything myself. These days... In the age of computers, it's a lot more complicated than that, and, and, and most of us can't do that. If we need surgery, we, we go to a professional. We go to a surgeon, uh, someone who, who's studied for years and years and years and knows the ins and outs of, of the body and, and can operate on us. I've never seen anybody do open-heart surgery on themselves that, that would not be wise. When it comes to our relationship with God... It's a little bit different. I'm a pastor, and I've done lots of studying, and so I've, I've got a pretty good picture of, of God's revelation through Scripture. But the problem with, with seeing a pastor as a professional is that we can give the impression that the pastor is responsible for our spiritual growth. And we end up not knowing how to feed ourselves. We don't touch our Bible during the week because, well, we can come on Sunday morning or watch a video and, and get our fill from the pastor. It's, it's, it's like a bunch of pigs running to the trough at feeding time. And what's the result? Baby Christians. Fat baby Christians who think that they've received their fill because they've heard from the pastor on Sunday. Another problem with seeing the pastor as a professional Christian is that they get put on a, on a pedestal where they're guaranteed to fall off. You know, pastors are not professional Christians. And I know that sounds silly when, when you say it, you know, a professional Christian, but that's how pastors are seen sometimes. We're no, we are no different than you. What we are is, is what Paul called himself, is we're the, we're the chief of sinners. That doesn't mean, mean that we've necessarily, we necessarily sin more than anybody else, but it means that we, we recognize that like everyone else, we're prone to wander. We're all in the same boat. We need each other. And so we model owning our own stuff, our own sin, taking it to the foot of the cross and leading others to do the same where we can find forgiveness and wholeness and freedom. When we read the book of James, it's, uh, you can notice that with one exception, James was written to the average Christian. Out, out of 54 imperatives in James, the only one that relates to the clergy is the one from last week where, where the person was directed to call for the elders of the church to pray for them when they were sick. And even then, the initiative was to come from the so-called lay person who was sick. 
So James was written to the average follower of Jesus in the congregation. And all through the letter, James urges us to live out our faith in practical ways. He says, if the seed of the gospel has been landed in a, a soft, fertile heart, there will be fruit of righteousness. There will be more love and more joy and more peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and all the fruit of the Spirit. There will be change. We'll become becoming more and more like Jesus all the time as we walk with each other, with Jesus, by his grace, by his power in community. Every single in imperative in James has to do with either loving God or loving people. And the vast majority of them have to do with loving people, which makes sense because Jesus said that when we love others, we, we actually love him. And I've, I've heard people say things like, well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at, at loving God, but I'm not so good at loving people. Well, actually, they can't be separated. It, it's impossible. You cannot separate loving God from loving people. So again, we're in the last sermon in James. And James doesn't close off his letter with any of the greetings that we're used to in Paul's letters. In, in Paul's letters, he, he, he has uh, some, some greetings to people he knows in, in, in the churches and, and maybe a benediction. Uh, James doesn't have any of that. He closes off with, with another imperative. No niceties. Two short verses, one sentence, and but some very important truths that we can grab onto and, and let sink into our heads. So let's go to James chapter 5. If you have your Bibles open there, you can watch on the screen as well. James chapter 5, verse 19. My brothers, if any among you wanders away from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now there are four truths I want you to see here. Firstly, number one, our faith is not a private matter. Number two, we have a responsibility to help each other grow. Number three, sin is not a trivial matter. And number four, bringing back someone who wanders from the truth reigns in a chain reaction of sins. So James begins this passage in the same way that he began several other passages. He says, my brothers. At least a dozen times in this short letter, James calls the readers of his letter brothers. And when he says brothers, he's, he's not just talking to the men here. Brothers in this context means brothers and sisters. It means, it means everyone who, who was brought into the family of God through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And it's really important to remember that we, we are family. So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've received his forgiveness based on his death and resurrection 2,000 years ago, then like it or not, we're family. And that's pretty cool. But it does come with a lot of responsibility. We have a duty to help each other grow and to make sure that we don't do anything that would cause others to stumble. Now what I want you to notice about this wandering person James is talking about in verse 19 is, is that he or she is from among the body of believers. So, so they're, a, they're a professing Christ follower. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back. If anyone from among you wanders from the truth. So it's not talking about going out and, and seeking after lost people who don't know Jesus. The context here is that, that these are people from within the body of Christ who have somehow lost their way. And James doesn't say what the reason is. It could be any number of things, but, but uh, something has distracted them so that the truth of the gospel is no longer important to them and so they've wandered away. Remember the parable of the soils that Jesus told. It's told in all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, let's turn to, to Luke and we'll look at, at uh, uh, part of that parable. Uh, Jesus has already told the parable and then he's going to explain it. And so I, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. And then we'll read what Jesus has to say about the parable. So Jesus tells this, this parable. He, he says a farmer goes into his field. He's, he's got a sack of, of seeds in his left hand. He takes his right hand and he, and, and, he, and he puts it in the sack and he pulls out the seeds and he scatters it indiscriminately on, on the ground, sowing the seed. And it falls on, on various uh, types of soil. 
Some of it falls on hard, packed ground and, and the seed that, that's, that lands there, the birds come and they take it away and it has no chance to, to sprout forth life. Uh, some of it falls on, on uh, soil that's filled with rocks and it's shallow and, and so uh, some of those seeds, they, they spring forth life a little bit but they don't have enough depth and so they they die off immediately because they can't get the moisture needed for life. They can't get the nutrients for the soil. Others of it falls on, on ground that's filled with weeds and those weeds choke the life out of those seeds so they can't produce life. And still others fall on soil that's, that's uh, been tilled, the rocks have been picked, the weeds have been pulled, and, the, and the, there's water and they have all the nutrients and and the seeds that fall on that soil spring forth life and produce a bountiful crop for the farmer. Well, the disciples heard this parable and they're a little bit confused and they asked Jesus to explain what he meant. And here's what he said in explaining the parable. Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while and in the time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So back to James. Now remember the person James was talking about here was someone from among them, a follower of Jesus who had wandered away from the truth. And the people that, that Jesus is, is talking about in Luke chapter 8 may well be believers as well. Some of them might be. There are lots of different reasons why, why the word of God might not take root in a person's heart. And any one of, of these reasons could refer to you or me at different times of our lives. First of all, he says maybe their hearts have become hard for whatever reason. Maybe they're angry about something. Maybe they, they've been hurt and they become bitter and their hearts have, have become hard by continually nurturing, uh, nurturing negative thoughts towards somebody. Or maybe, maybe it's somebody who, who studied the Word and, 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 and they, they know their Bible inside and out and, and they just think, well, I know all this already. And, and so the Word of God doesn't penetrate. And so they wander off their own way. Or maybe their, their faith is shallow and, and they're in it for what they can get out of it for themselves. Ruth and I went to Bible college with uh, several people who are no longer believers. They, they no longer say that they're followers of Jesus. I'm not exactly sure why, but they were all excited. When we went to Bible college, we were all excited together about walking with Jesus together and digging into the Word and, and, and discovering what, what God had for our lives. And, and some of them, for whatever reason, wandered away from the truth. And then Jesus said there are some who, who were more concerned about the things of the earth, like pleasure and getting rich. And they get distracted by things that glitter, sort of like a fish going after a shiny lure, grabbing onto it and only be, to, to be reeled in to a certain death. And Jesus said, the person with this kind of heart was too immature to bear fruit. Their, their focus was on the wrong things. And then, of course, he says there's another kind of person who, with a, a good, soft, fertile heart, they not only receive the word, but it gets planted deep and, and it bears a lot of uh, fruit of obedience. They continually get filled with, with more of the character of Jesus, more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more gentleness, more all the fruit of the Spirit. They become more and more like Jesus as they follow him by his grace and his power together in community. And so back to James, he says that if any one of us wanders away from the truth like that in any way, that is away from the things that he's previously exhorted us to do, then we are to go and lovingly and humbly woo them back. And that leads us to our first point. Your faith 
is not a private matter. My faith is not a private matter. Now, I, go, I, I know this goes against our, uh, our Western values, our, uh, evangelical and especially Baptist values. One of the tenets of Baptist identity is individual soul liberty. And I know that's a mouthful, but it simply means that, that each of us as individuals has the right to interpret Scripture without the church or, or any governing body or any other individual uh, forcing their beliefs on us. And this is very true. Our, our belief in God and what he's done for us through, through Christ cannot be forced on us by a church or any other individual. We make that choice by ourselves, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And nobody can make that choice for us. So that, that's all very true. However, that doesn't mean that we are not accountable to each other. James had just finished writing in the previous passage that we should confess our sins to one another, which means that we need to be accountable to each other. The writer of Hebrews said that we're to consider how to spur each other on to, to love and good deeds. Paul told the Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So your faith is not a private matter. There's an old cowboy chorus that I heard in the, in the 70s. It goes like this, and, and you sort of have to sing it with a, with a you know, western twang when you sing it. Not sure if I'll sing it for you, so we'll see what happens. But it goes, me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. You hear the twang? Me and Jesus got our own thing going. We don't need anybody to tell us what it's all about. It sort of sounds like, like this guy. He, he may not have meant it like that, but it sort of sounds like he doesn't need anybody but, but Jesus. It, that's it. Just him. Keep out of his faith. Keep out of his face. He, he's accountable to nobody but God. Not sure he meant it like that, but that's sort of how it comes across to me. Now, the guy who wrote this song actually wrote another one called I Like Beer. And so I guess he needs beer and, and Jesus. But we, we like to think that we can live our lives independently, like we don't need anybody, but that's not what the church is. Paul described the church in 1 Corinthians as, as a body with many parts that are interdependent on one, one another. We, we cannot get along without each other. I need you. And you need me. We all need each other because none of us has all the gifts. We need each other. And the gifts that God has given us aren't so that we can get all puffed up for our own benefit. He gave us the gifts to build each other up, to build up the church. And so James says, if anyone from among you wanders from the truth, go bring them back. That leads us to the second point. We have a responsibility to help each other grow. Now, there are so many distractions out there in the world that it's so easy for us to get sucked into a wrong way of thinking. And we've talked about this, these distractions as, as a raging river that we're trying to, 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 to walk into and push against the current. And it and pulls us and, and it tries to get our eyes off of Christ and onto other things. And it takes all the energy, all the effort we have coupled with, with the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to push against that current. Friends, we need our community of faith to help us stay on the path to maturity. We can't grow on our own. It's completely and unequivocally impossible. And that means we need to be purposeful about allowing ourselves to be accountable to each other and that's become really difficult during COVID-19, hasn't it? We have to be so much more purposeful now that we can't meet together in, in, in person. It's not impossible, though. Now, I'm very thankful for the Zoom groups that, that Jeff has, has started uh, after the services on, on Sunday. Last week, we broke into, into three small groups. We, we shared our hearts. We, we uh, prayed together, and it was really sweet fellowship and I know a lot of you can't do that on on Sunday mornings but if, if you can't do it on Sunday mornings with you and, and I would encourage you if, if you can please join us if you can't do that make sure that you're getting together uh, either in socially distancing in, in person or by zoom so that we can get that fellowship we need to posture ourselves in humility and recognize that that we're all in the same boat I'm not okay 
I've tried to be open about that. And the truth is, you're not okay. But another truth is, that's okay. And it's not okay to stay there. Jesus is okay for us, but he, what he wants to do is he wants to take us from where we are to where he wants to be. But in order for that to happen, we, we need to recognize that we're all broken and we need each other to grow. Now this wanderer, James said, is not to be left to their own devices. And he says the burden is on the community of faith to bring him back. Third point, sin is not a trivial manner, or matter. We're going to be talking about this uh, more when we get to the, to the uh, series in Galatians in about three weeks. Some people think that because they've been given freedom in Christ, it doesn't matter how they live. Can, you know, God's going to forgive me, and all I have to do is ask him forgiveness so I can live however I want and ask him for forgiveness, and that's going to be okay. What does it matter? These are my own private sins. Well, that's a, a complete misunderstanding of the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus does set us free, but it doesn't set us free to sin. It sets us free from the bondage of sin so that we don't have to sin. Let him know whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death. Sin is not a trivial matter. And we dare not think that we can just go on with our lives and live however we want and think that God's going to just turn a blind eye or that it's not hurting anyone and so what's the big deal? Sin's not a trivial matter. Here's what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So our sin cost Jesus his life. Yes, our, our, our freedom our salvation is a, is a free gift of God. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't costly. It was a huge price that God paid to buy us our freedom. And to take our sin lightly is to make a mockery of the cross of Christ. So sin is not a trivial matter. Lastly, let him who know whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So what does it mean that it'll cover a multitude of sins if we do this? Now there are several ideas as to what this might mean, but let me tell you what I, I think it means. Bringing back someone who has wandered from the truth reigns in a chain reaction of sin. I, th I think it's quite simple. I think it simply means that one sin leads to another. There, there's a ripple effect to our sin. Take an Old Testament example of, of David's sin against Bathsheba. What happened there? He sees her bathing. What does he do? Now at that point, he, he could have turned away and put it out of his mind and that would have been the end of it. But he didn't do that, did he? What did he do? So one look turned into a gaze. And that gaze, as he, as, as he ruminated on, on what he saw... As he massaged it in his mind, that turned into lust. And that lust turned into an invitation. The invitation uh, turned into adultery and then adultery to the big cover-up, which led to murder. And that's how it is with sin. And that's exactly how James describes this process of temptation in chapter 1, verse 14. He says, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has 
conceived gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So I think what James is saying in chapter 5, verse 20, is that by going after someone, bringing back someone who, who has wandered from the truth, when we do that, we, we rein in a chain reaction of sin. And, and, and one sin leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another. And it doesn't just affect the person that's doing the sinning, it affects others as well. In a lot of different ways. But one of the ways is that when one of us is hurting, the whole body hurts. Friends, this is the body of Christ in action. Our faith is not a trivial matter. Sin, or our, our, our faith is not a private matter. Sin is not a trivial matter. It, it grieves the heart of God. It hurts all of our relationships, our relationship on the, on the horizontal level with people and on the vertical level with God. And we should love each other so much that we're willing to take the risk of being misunderstood if we have to confront someone in love and humility in order to bring them back into the family. And it's not just the job of the pastors, the staff, the church staff, or, or, or the church board. That's the responsibility of, of everyone in the body. That's what love looks like. You know, and I'm no different than you are. I'm, I'm just as prone to wander as you are. And I give you permission to love me enough to bring me back if I wander away. And I hope you'll do the same for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Um, your word is, is uh, true and it's powerful. And thank you that we have the privilege of living in the body of Christ and walking with each other and walking with you. And I pray that, that you would help us to take seriously uh, our faith and, and our, our responsibility that we have to each other in our, in our growth, that we aren't doing this alone. That we're, we're walking with, with you, of course, but we're also walking with each other. And I pray that, that during this difficult time during COVID that you would teach us how to do that. Help us to be creative in loving each other in this way over this next while. We pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen.